Hi, and welcome back to Chapter 11 in your Commercial Law Curriculum. Today we're going to be talking about third-party contracts. So far we've been talking about contracts that involve just two parties, the promisor and the promisee, and contracts that set out each party's duties and obligations to each other, performance being the final phase of completion of the contract. There are, however, some situations where a third party is involved, although the third party is not directly involved in the performance of the contract, they may reap some benefits from the performance of the contract. And thus we call them third party beneficiaries. And the contracts are third party beneficiary contracts. And so in this type of situation we have the promisor, the promisee, and then a third party who benefits from the performance under the original contract. This person again is known as a beneficiary. They are entitled to receive benefits from the contract itself. Now, the law recognizes two distinct groups of beneficiaries, intended beneficiaries, which include donee beneficiaries and creditor beneficiaries, and incidental beneficiaries, or those that are sort of secondary to the contract. Um, as we move through today, we're going to discuss each one of these types. Before we get started, I want to make sure that you understand by the end of this chapter, the way to classify the different third-party relationships. I want you to be able to explain what the term privity means, distinguish between an assignment and a delegation, discuss the types of rights that are not assignable, and determine when a novation is the appropriate contractual vehicle for a train. Okay, let's talk about intended beneficiaries. If when, during the contracting process, the parties intend for a specific third party to benefit that third party is called an intended beneficiary. Um, th that intended beneficiary is not necessarily involved in the contracting process or even in the performance of the obligations under the contract, uh, but they do benefit from the contract in some way, shape, or form. To determine whether a third party is an intended beneficiary, we want to ask three questions. Did the promisee intend the third party to benefit from the contract? Number two, did the beneficiary rely on the contractual rights conferred? And number three, did the performance run directly from a promisor to the third party beneficiary? If any of these questions is answered yes, the third party is probably an intended beneficiary. If you can't answer yes to any one of these three questions, then you probably do not have an intended third party beneficiary. So let's see some typical situations where intended beneficiary relationships arise. One would be a donee beneficiary. In this circumstance, a promisee makes a gift to a third party donee who benefits in some way from the contractual relationship between the original promisor and promisee. We see this a lot in life insurance policies. This is the most common donee beneficiary situation. One person agrees to purchase insurance on his or her own life or the life of another person, and then names a third person as a beneficiary, the third party beneficiary. If the insured person dies, the beneficiary, the third party beneficiary, receives the proceeds of the life insurance policy. The promisor is the insurance company, the promisee is the insured, can be a spouse, a husband, wife, for example, um, and the survivor, which is often the other spouse, is the intended donee beneficiary. Now, as you might have guessed from the name, a donee beneficiary is uh, the subject of a gift. And uh, because it's a gift, uh, it can be changed at any time. So the, the party that's making the gift can change the donee beneficiary's rights without getting the donee beneficiary's consent. If, however, um, the, the contract has vested, in other words, the, 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 the donor has died, therefore, um, bringing about the, um, the insurance company's obligation to pay, at that point, the third-party beneficiary's rights are irrevocable. Um, so donee beneficiary is our first type of intended beneficiary. The next type of third-party beneficiary contract we'll talk about is the creditor beneficiary. And this is a situation where a third party to whom the promisee owes a legal duty and obligation has sort of transferred their rights to that third party. It often arises out of a debt. If you think about this, if John owes George $10 and George says, 
I'm going to transfer my rights to that $10 to Steve, then John now owes Steve that $10. And that is a third party intended beneficiary. And that third party now has the right to enforce the debt against the original contractor. And finally, let's talk about incidental beneficiaries. These are third parties who benefit indirectly from a contract, but they're not intended beneficiaries. So for instance, if I wanted to buy a boat, I contract with Mr. Johnson to buy a boat. The contract is between myself and Mr. Johnson. It doesn't matter that my best friend is going to be able to ride on that boat and go fishing with me. Um, they're not a part of the contract. It's just an, an incidental benefit. So they have no rights to enforce the contract against either me or uh, Mr. Johnson from whom I'm purchasing the boat. Just an incidental, although uh, a good benefit, um, that flows to my friend. Take a second and look at Exhibit 11-3 in your book. It gives a good summary of third-party beneficiaries. I want to talk to you briefly about privity. Uh, this is uh, called the privity problem and is usually referred to as privity of contract. And a promisor and a promisee, the original two participants in a contract, have privity of contract. It's a private contract between the two of them. It means a direct relationship. Under traditional notions of contract law, only those with privity of contract could uh, bring an enforcement action or sue for breach if a problem arose. Today, that's been ex expanded, and even without privity, um, third-party beneficiaries, intended third-party beneficiaries, may be able to sue to enforce a contract. So that's a change from the old law of privity of contract towards the no new, more liberal interpretation where TPBs or third-party beneficiaries can enforce contracts. Another area where we deal with third parties to contracts is the area of assignments and delegations. We'll talk about each here, but this is a relationship that arises when a third party, other than the original promisor and promisee, agrees to accept rights, duties, or obligations under a contract that has been uh, previously created and executed. An assignment is a transfer of a contractual right to a third party. The individual who's making the transfer is known as the assignor, and the person receiving the contractual right transferred is known as the assignee. Upon completion of the assignment, the assignee acquires the rights the assignor originally had. All performance required from the assignor under the contract is now the responsibility of the assignee. We most commonly see assignments of contract in lease situations. For example, if Mr. Turner is a landlord who leases his house to Ms. Peterson, the tenant, um, Ms. Peterson gets a new job and moves out of town. She doesn't want to breach the lease. So she transfers her rights under the lease to her friend, Mrs. Stewart. Now Mrs. Stewart, who is the assignee, has all of the responsibilities under the lease, including the obligation to pay the rent. We also want to talk briefly, briefly about delegation and contracts. Assignments and delegations are different. An assignment, again, involves rights where delegation involves duties. Under a delegation, the original promisor finds a new promisor or a substitute to perform um, their original duties under the contract. The delegator is the original promisor and the delegatee is the new promisor or the person who will perform the delegated duties. Um, the delegator, in this case, always reminds, remains liable under the contract. And um, some things cannot be delegated. If, if, the, uh, if the duty is personal in nature to the original uh, promisor, the, the delegator can't delegate that duty. And finally, I want to distinguish between what we've been talking about, assignments and delegations, and novations, which we discussed in Chapter 9. A novation is a substitution of a new contract for an old one. Even though there's three parties involved here in some situations, um, the, the, the novation is where we completely replace one contract with the other one. The original contract is invalidated and the original parties are released. This requires a mutual agreement of all the parties involved and, and the terms can even be different. So assignment is and delegation are different in that they um, assign or delegate rights or obligations in the original contract. Novation, even though it may be moved to a third party, is dispensing with the old contract and creating a new one in its place. So in summary, although contracts normally have two parties, a promisor and a promisee, sometimes we deal with a third party known as a third party beneficiary who reaps the advantages of the contract. 
beneficiaries or third party beneficiaries can be intended, uh, which are donee and creditor beneficiaries or incidental beneficiaries. Um, third party beneficiaries no longer require privity of contract between the parties for the third party to be able to enforce rights and obligations under the contract. An assignment is a present transfer of a contractual right, whereas a delegation is a present transfer of a contractual duty or obligation to another party. Remember that there's a difference between assignments or delegations and novations uh, in that assignments and delegations are dealing with the original contract and novations are completely new contracts. Well, that's all we have for this week. Um, as always, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care.